Hello, listeners. Welcome to The Bible Never Said That. On this podcast, we talk about popular sayings that have permeated the culture and the church, even though they are theologically contorted. My name is Shara Donahue, and today we are exploring the saying, better safe than sorry. Now, don't get me wrong. Wisdom is important. We talked about this in episode five, when we discussed the danger of following your heart wherever it wants to go. But securing our own safety is not something we should do either. There is a difference between using wisdom, which we are commanded to seek, and never taking a risk. God is our hiding place. And Psalm 46.1 reminds us that God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. This is part of who God is, and he will continue to be those things wherever we go. This does not mean we should be taking unnecessary or foolish risks, but it does mean that if God asks us to take a chance, we should. Hear that? If it is God who leads us into danger, we can follow him. If God is leading is the key, we are not to be fools or poor stewards of the life God has entrusted us to. But we can follow Jesus into danger and expect him to be with us. Jesus himself was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit in Matthew chapter 4, Mark chapter 1, and Luke chapter 4. He is hungry, he is weary, and he is confronted and tempted by Satan, who seeks to destroy God's beloved. We just have to keep in mind, God may very well lead us into wild places. A classic illustration comes to us in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. If you've heard it, you probably love it. And just in case you haven't, I had to put it in here. One of the travelers through Narnia is talking to Mr. Beaver, who is a beaver. Animals are quite human-like in these tales. But Susan is about to meet King Aslan for the first time and has just found out Aslan is not what she imagined. Mr. Beaver says, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. The king may not be safe, but we are reminded he is good. This story points to our God. My pastor recently reminded us that hearing the voice of God is not a comfortable experience. In the scriptures, it was a visceral experience filled with fear. When you look at Exodus 20, 18 through 22, You see that the Israelites who had seen God plague Egypt, set them free, and part the Red Sea have a relatable experience. The scriptures say, when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen, 
but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. I find it fascinating that Moses has to go into the darkness to meet with God here. Jesus clearly calls himself the light of the world in John 8, 12. So we know that when we venture into darkness, because God has beckoned us there, the light comes with us. We get to be those who bring light into dark places. We get to be torchbearers and light carriers, lamps which shine most brightly in the dark. We shouldn't be like the Israelites sending Moses or more relevant to us, relying on other believers, missionaries, or pastors, instead of being willing to trust and hear from God ourselves. As believers, we are all gifted differently, but that does not excuse us from obedience. Remember, our obedience is how we show we love God. It's how we show him we trust him. We can't be telling God we want to hear his voice and then scoff at what he says to us because it threatens our comfort or false securities. If you know anything about the Apostle Paul, you know that he did not minister in safety. He heard the voice of Jesus in Acts chapter 9 and was blinded and then was told by Ananias, who was sent by God to pray for him and to heal Paul, how much Paul would suffer for Jesus' name. In 2 Corinthians 11, you find a list of some of the hardships he experienced in ministry. I'll give you just a snippet with verses 25 through 31. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. It was in danger, not safety, Paul served the Lord faithfully and sacrificially. If we don't follow where God leads, out of fear or hopes of preserving safety, we will miss out on the life he wants for us. And I'm not saying we are all called to the hardships of Paul, but we must be willing to obey God, whatever that looks like. For if we miss the blessings of obeying God, sorrow will outweigh any amount of safety. This better safe than sorry idea, when taken to the extreme, can look like us trying to create a life we don't need God for. Where the idea of him is nice and comforting, but we never take steps of faith. If this is what our life looks like, we have to ask ourselves, what is our faith truly in?
living out of faith that demands no risk means we are most likely following false gods of comfort and security. These functional saviors lead us away from the abundant life of following Jesus and into a lackluster and lukewarm faith that looks to Jesus to keep us far from danger, never willing to risk peril for the sake of the phenomenal. David Platt warns in his book, Radical, we are settling for a Christianity that revolves around catering to ourselves when the central message of Christianity is actually about abandoning ourselves. He also says, radical obedience to Christ is not easy. It's not comfort, not health, not wealth, and not prosperity in this world. Radical obedience to Christ risks losing all these things. But in the end, such risk finds its reward in Christ, and he is more than enough for us. In Hebrews 11, we have this wonderful passage that reminds us of what living a life of faith looks like. After spending some time going over the faithful lives of Abraham, Moses, Sarah, and a few others, the author of Hebrews says, And what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. And that's Hebrews 11, 32 through 38. The world was not worthy of them. Are we living in such a way? We must seek first God's kingdom not safety. This is a God who saw fit to offer up his beloved son for our sake. And we sit in our homes wondering if the risk is worth it when God asks us to do something. The reason for this is that we don't see God correctly. When we see the truth of his love for us, when we see his character rightly, that he is holy, that he is continuously faithful, and that he is good in all he does, we begin to emerge from our couches and security systems and prayerfully risk where he asks us to do so. We forget how many things require risk. Marriage requires risk, having children, risk, So we have to ask, where does exercising wisdom end and trusting with faith beyond what your eyes can see begin? One of the scariest things I ever felt God leading me to do was to risk being vulnerable enough to love again after having my heart shattered by another. Spoiler, I did. But my husband of over 15 years now had to deal with me trying to break up with him multiple times when we were dating. And he was patient enough to ask me if it was because of fear. 
And then he would ask if I would pray about it for a couple of days and let him know after I talked to Jesus. He is a patient man. (laughs) And he fought for me by sending me to God. Now, at this time in my life, I was telling God I would follow him anywhere. I was asking him, send me anywhere in the world, persecution or not. And for me at that time, that seemed the safer option than risking a relationship again. But God asked me to trust him where I felt most vulnerable because he wanted me to be free. Keep in mind, I was trusting God, not the man who would become my husband. I do dearly love him, but he is not my God. He is fallible and lovable, but not perfect. But when I look back over all these years and see what I could have missed, if I had let fear drive me, if I had chosen to be safe instead of sorry, I am so grateful that I didn't take the safe route. And there is not one piece of me that is sorry I took the path I did. So I just want you to take a moment and ask God if you are trusting him, not only with what is easy to trust him with, but with the areas of your life that feel most perilous. It could be marriage or not being married, having children, fostering children, adopting children, or not having children, deciding on a treatment for a tough diagnosis, a new job or leaving a job, moving across the world, or crossing the street to share the gospel with a soul in need. Where is God asking you to trust him? I'll close this out today with this quote from Nick Ripkin, author of The Insanity of Obedience, Walking with Jesus in Tough Places. He says, let us be clear, the will of God is not always the safest place to be, but it is the only place to be. Let's pray together for a holy boldness that will bring more souls into the kingdom of God and show us and those around us what the good life truly is. Jesus, I thank you so much that in you our souls are safe and that because of that we can go into the world with a gutsy gentleness that proclaims the truth of the gospel and invites people to know you and the power of your resurrection. Help us to fight the temptation to disobey you under the guise of safety and to push past fear into your presence. We want to see you. Help us to be willing to take the risks needed to do so. And it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me today as we looked at the risk worth taking. The resources and books referred to in this episode can be found in the show notes at lifeaudio.com slash podcast or on iTunes. And I so appreciate it when you rate and review this podcast so others can find us. Until next time, may you seek the abundant life Jesus died to give and live in the truth that sets people free.